All right, now we're looking at Esau hated in the womb. Romans 9, 8 to 16, and answer to Malachi 1, 1 to 3, which Malachi prophesies and then Romans fulfills. So the phrase, Jacob I did love, and Esau I did hate, portrays not the emotions of love and hate of God, but the stark contrast between the blessings Jacob received from God and through Jacob upon all mankind due to God's election of Jacob as the seed of the promised Messiah Savior of the world to come through Abraham's versus not electing Esau for that purpose. God's sovereignty must prevail in order for his righteousness to prevail voluntarily by the people of his creation. This will take some work, but God is beyond time, and he's allowing God's sovereignty, his sovereignty, to prevail in a way that man will choose that sovereignty instead of being forced into it like robots. So Romans 9.13 is not to be taken that God literally hates certain people. It is an hyperbole a linguistic device portraying a stark contrast, just as one can say to emphasize the difference in car velocity. He went by that car so fast that it was standing still. Was it? So the Bible can say, with respect to relative blessings bestowed upon either, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau to demonstrate the stark contrast between blessings God chose to bestow upon Jacob instead of Esau and through Jacob upon all mankind. This is due to the Lord's election of Jacob instead of Esau, to be in the line of the seed of Abraham to a Messiah, Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. It didn't happen by man's volition, by choice, but by God's absolute sovereignty. The phrase, according as it has been written, Jacob I did love and Esau I did hate, in Romans 9.13 is a quotation from Malachi, Three, two to three. Let me see if I can fix this. Okay. As a quotation from Malachi one, two and three, which is an answer to Jacob's verses three, one and two, wherein Jacob's Israel's answers. So the phrase, Jacob I did love and Esau I did hate, in Romans. 9.13 portrays not the emotions of love and hate of God, but the stark contrast between the blessings Jacob received from God and through his sovereignty alone, and through Jacob upon all mankind due to God's election of Jacob as the seed of the promised Messiah Savior of the world to come through Abraham versus not electing Esau for that purpose. Take a look at Romans 9, 6. And it is not possible that the word of God hath failed, for not all who are of Israel are these Israel, nor because they are seed of Abraham are all children. But in Isaac shall a seed be called to thee, in Isaac, that is, the children of the flesh. These are not children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned for seed. Notice God's sovereignty in all of this. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time it takes for a life to be born from conception, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also Rebekah, having conceived by one, literally by one conception, by Isaac our father. For they being not yet born, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to choice, might remain, not of works, but of him who is calling, but of God who was calling, it was said to her, the greater shall serve the lesser. Genesis twenty-five thirteen. that's Romans 9, 13. According to has, as it has been written, Jacob I did love, and Esau I did hate. Obviously a hyperbole. So Romans 9, 13 is not to be taken that God literally hates certain people. It is an hyperbole, a linguistic device portraying a stark contrast. Just as one can say to emphasize the difference in car velocity, he went by that car so fast that it was standing still. And so the Bible can say with respect to relative blessings bestowed upon either, 
that God loved Jacob and hated Esau to demonstrate the stark contrast between the blessings God chose to bestow upon Jacob instead of Esau by his sovereignty alone, not by human chance or human decision, and through Jacob upon all mankind. This is due to the Lord's election of Jacob. To what end, instead of Esau? To be in the line of the seed of Abraham, to a Messiah, Savior of the world, God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. The phrase, according as it hath been written, Jacob I did love, and Esau I did hate, in John uh, Romans 9.13, is a quotation from Malachi 1, 2, and 3, which is in answer to verses 1, 1, and 2. Flip that over here. There it is. When Israel questions God's love for her, God's answer to Israel's questioning of him, Jacob I did love and Esau I did hate, implies that his love for Israel was demonstrated by the blessings flowing to Israel through his election to bestow blessings upon Jacob, Israel's father, through his love as opposed to choosing Esau. Malachi, let's just review Malachi 1, 1 to 3. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel. This is before this all happened in Romans chapter 9 in the first century. Before this, oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance to the jackals of the wilderness. All this comes to, to play through the Messiah Savior in the first century born of God by his sovereignty. So, according as has been written, Jacob I did love, Esau I did hate, in Romans 9.13 is a quotation from Malachi 1, 2, and 3, which is an answer to Malachi 1, 1, and 2. When Israel questions God's love for her, and God's answer to Israel questioning of him, Jacob I did love, and Esau I did hate, implies that his love for Israel was demonstrated by the blessings flowing to Israel through his election to bestow blessings upon Jacob, Israel's father, through his love as opposed to choosing Esau. Note that God did bless Esau and his descendants as well, the Edomites, many times, but in the end that they were to be destroyed, hence a temporal emotional love and hate is not in view in this passage. Here's a corroborative verse, Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me, Jesus Christ, and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. This is not to say that one is to start hating one's parents and family, in order to become a disciple of the Lord, that's hyperbole here. Instead, there is in view in Luke 126, 1426, a stark contrast between the focus, priority, and devotion to the Lord of a true disciple, which is so much greater in comparison with his focus, priority, and devotion to his family members that it can be viewed as the difference between love and hate. So let's go back. Pharaoh raised up to do evil. Romans 9, 17 and 24. Interesting. The next verses in Romans chapter 9. Nine seventeen. Move on to Romans 9.17. We look about Pharaoh. What about Pharaoh? 9.17. Let's see. Okay. Let's see if we can figure out what we just looked at with relative to Jacob and Esau. What about Pharaoh? Same kind of idea. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. Are we not talking about God's sovereignty here? 
that's at stake by men's volition, though. God could just take control and destroy, which he did in the worldwide flood, and start over again, which he did not. He left eight to continue on. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. So Paul continues to defend, having trouble with font size here. Seventeen. All right. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. So Paul continues to defend the sovereignty and holiness of God relative to the, to the plagues God put upon Pharaoh, and Egypt, and God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart in this matter. Paul moves from defending God's sovereignty and holiness relative to God's continual exercising of compassion for Moses and Israel despite Israel's failures. What can the, uh, the angelic, demonic side say? Hey, look, foul. Israel's failed. And you're treating them with kid gloves, or so to speak, with favor. So Paul moves from defending God's sovereignty and holiness relative to God's continual exercising of compassion for Moses and Israel, despite Israel's failures, to defending God's actions in bringing plagues upon Pharaoh and Egypt and God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Scripture has already stipulated that God would have been justified in destroying Pharaoh and Egypt due to their oppression of Israel, and Pharaoh's recalcitrant insolence toward God out of his own volition, Pharaoh's volition. But God chose instead to impose plagues upon Pharaoh and Egypt, which did not destroy them, in order that Pharaoh and all Egyptians might know that there is no one like him, his sovereignty, his justice, his righteousness, and his holiness, and hence believe in him as their God unto salvation. Can the demonic world say that God did not give Pharaoh and Egypt a chance? His integrity, his righteousness, is not imposed on his free will without justice and sovereignty and righteousness and holiness. By virtue of God's imposing plagues upon Pharaoh in Egypt, God said to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you, Pharaoh, up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. God is not dependent upon human response to decide what he will do. This is what we're looking at. And humanity deserves destruction. That's what we're looking at. Yet God provides his grace and a way out of that destruction through faith in him to all. God will see to it that his people Israel will be freed from enslavement by Pharaoh as a fulfillment of his covenant with Abraham and his seed Israel. When Abraham made his covenant to Abraham, uh, God made his covenant to Abraham unilaterally. Could it have failed? Yes. God's justice he needed to intervene. He allowed it to come to the point of destruction, Israel's failure, and turned around by grace, but he allowed all men an opportunity to believe and be saved. As God imposed one plague after another upon Egypt, Pharaoh responded to each with rebellion out of his own volition, and each with deception and each with recalcitrant insolence toward God and Israel refusing to let her go. Oh, I'll let you go, and then not. Note that Pharaoh's responses were of his own free will, and God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart brought out Pharaoh's rebellious nature and all the more, in effect sealing him to his own temporal and eternal destruction. He'll only go so far God will, and then he leaves you to your own devices and no longer provides his grace. Now you're on your own. You can still believe, but you're so hardened that you won't. So if God had hardened Pharaoh's heart such that Pharaoh had no free will choice but to recant any faith in God and renege on his promise to let Israel go, then God would defeat a number of key purposes of his, of his which demanded Pharaoh's and Egypt's free will and were implied in the passage Paul quoted from in Exodus chapter 9. Let's look at that. <clears throat> 